Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator for the VMFA, and I get to coordinate this monthly gallery talk, which has um, been virtual for quite some time now, um, which really allows your presenters to bring you some things that maybe you wouldn't get to see otherwise. And today is no different. Um, for today's program, 3 and 30 plus, uh, it does focus on our special exhibition currently, The Dirty South, Contemporary Art, Material Culture, and the Sonic Impulse. And your presenters are Karen Getty, the Senior Tour Services Coordinator and the Educator for the Exhibition, and Robert Fenord, our Performing Arts Coordinator. This program will be a bit longer than normal, hence the plus. So with that, Robert, Karen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Izzy. I really appreciate that introduction. And um, I'm so happy to be with you today. And I'm really excited to be doing this program with you, Robert. Um, this is our, our first time sort of co-hosting anything. And we've really had a great time preparing for this. And we get a little carried away. So, you know, Izzy, if we're running past our time, feel free to hop on and give us a heads up because we've just, um, yeah, really enjoyed, enjoyed this. So um, today we are gonna be doing our three and 30 presentation together. And it is um, on the exhibition that we currently have, Dirty South, Contemporary Art, Material Culture, and the Sonic Impulse. This exhibition is gonna be on view through September 6th. So if you haven't already seen it, um, or even if you have, we hope that you come back again, especially after today's presentation and maybe learn something that you didn't know before. Um, so with that, I'm gonna quickly set up the exhibition for anybody who might not be familiar with it. Just gonna do a quick intro. Um, first, wanting to introduce you to our curator of the exhibition, Valerie Cassell Oliver. Valerie is our Sydney and Francis Lewis family curator of modern and contemporary art. And she's been with the VMFA for several years now. Prior to coming here, she was at the Contemporary Museum of Art in Houston, in Texas. And it was really down in Texas that Valerie, and maybe even prior to then, that she started a lot of this research that has come to fruition in this exhibition. Um, she's a lot of the artists that are gonna be that are in this exhibition, um, you know, she's had a working relationship with them for many years and has been researching this topic. So we're very um, thankful that Valerie came to VMFA and brought this amazing exhibition with her. So really quickly, just to kind of sum up in general, if I had to say what this exhibition was about in one sentence, here it is. Um, and just an FYI, you can move our faces out of the way. You can drag it with your mouse if we're in the way of any of the text or images you wanna see. Um, but the big idea is over the course of the last century, last hundred years, the music, fine art, folk art, and material culture of the African-American South has become linked and it's created an, an impact, um, a lasting impact on our landscape today. So just a couple of bullet points, and I promise I, I won't be, we, we will show you art. We will get into the art, but really quickly to set up the exhibition, it's important to know that the exhibition covers a hundred years, starting with about 1920, all the way up to 2020. And another thing that you need to know going in is that this exhibition is not about any one particular artist. Um, it's about the power of the collective aesthetic that they bring. Um, so it's the power in numbers that we're looking at. There's a, roughly a hundred different artists, all intergenerational. Some were born, you know, in the 1800s, others were born as late as the 1980s. So another thing that varies among the artists is their training. So some of them have received formal training, gone to school, gotten doctorates. Others are what uh, Valerie likes to call their their talents are more organic. She calls them it. She calls it intuitive intellectualism, and you know I know that's a mouthful and it's hard to remember. But 
a lot of scholars are moving away from using the term folk art. They definitely are moving away from like saying they're naive artists or um, primitive is, you know, because that sort of suggests that their work is less sophisticated and that is absolutely not the case. So um, these are folks that are self-taught or that have learned from passed down through generations. Um, yeah, so there's a range of talents and, and training. And lastly, there's about 130 different objects in this exhibition. So it's a lot and clearly we won't get to see all of them at all. We're just scratching the surface and they range in form, medium, genre. Just um, about the title, which some people aren't quite familiar with the, the term, the dirty South. So what does it mean? One of the most simple definitions, and I say one because there are several, um, the dirty South is a, it's a fluid term. It's not fixed. So it's sort of the meaning ebbs and flows depending on the context. Sometimes it's a geographical indicator. Um, it is often, in, and it's used really as a term of endearment to ironically mark the area that was formerly known as the Confederacy, the Southeastern portion of the United States. Um, and, you know, the way that I want you to think about the term dirty, a word that typically has negative connotations. I like to show an example of uh, the dish dirty rice, right? So it is called dirty rice, but it looks delicious, it is delicious. And what I want you to focus on with a dish like this and dirty and how it applies is, you know, it gives it flavor. There's a lot of um, a combination of ingredients, complexities, richness. And so when you're considering the title, The Dirty South, consider dirty in some of these ways. Now, another thing, it takes on some literal meaning. The South, as we all know, it's rooted in agriculture and the soil literally becomes a wellspring of life. It, it supports um, life as we know it. And so it is extremely important. So, you know, it literally means dirt, um, but also, and I bring in a picture from one of my favorite comedies, Airplane, um, you know, the, the heat of the South can be very oppressive and it, it can make you sweat. And people who live down South, especially with no AC, are very much used to this kind of, of, of sweat. And so thinking about dirty in that um, context as well. And lastly, think about an object like um, a stuffed animal that you had when you were a kid, you dragged it around everywhere, it got filthy dirty, or an old suitcase that belonged to your grandfather and you know it's dirty it's broken maybe and it's got his handprint embedded in it but that's what's so special about it um you know that's what gives objects a special energy sometimes it holds the energy of the person that maybe owned it and and so think about dirty in those ways too and throughout the exhibition there are many artists who use um, found objects that are often trash or discarded um, because of the energy that lives in that object. So we wanna think about it in that way. Finally, some people attribute, uh, they ask, where did it come from? It really came into popularity in 1995 when the group Goody Mob, pictured here, which FYI, that's CeeLo Green right in the for foreground all the way in the front. Um, but they came out with a song, What You Know About the Dirty South in 1995. So at that point, it really just, uh, you know, became very popular. And for a lot of people, the definition is now synonymous with Southern hip hop. So when you hear Dirty South, some people think, oh, Southern hip hop. But um, it, it, again, it's a fluid term, it, it varies, so. Now, as Valerie was kind of thinking about this exhibition and, and putting it together, she wanted to, she started to think about that term dirty South and Southern hip hop, but, but also the visual arts. And she was thinking all of these artists, whether it's music, visual art, what is it about, you know, this art or this part of the, the country that makes it uniquely South? What is it that makes something Southern. And she really identified three main themes and that's how she broke down the exhibition. And since this is supposed to be a three and 30, although we're, we're stretching the time a little bit, we have um, organized our talk in, into these themes. So we're gonna make a stop 
I'm not going to not going to promise you we're only going to show you three objects. We've got a little bit more, but we are going to make three stops in each of these sections. So to get started, we are going to be looking at the landscape and the landscape. You know, we can think about it in lots of different ways. We can think about it literally in the soil and agriculture. Um, but it's obviously much more than that. There's, uh, you know, there's there's so much to this land, but also the connection to um, African Americans and the land, which you know goes back to the times of slavery when you know enslaved people kind of had to make do with. Uh, what they had or what they could farm themselves. If the rations they received weren't enough, you know, they often, you know, would have to farm the land or make uh, whatever they needed from the raw materials of the land. So, and that was something that um, was familiar to them from a lot of, you know, indigenous African cultural traditions. So uh, this connection to the land and the natural environment, um, is something that we see in a lot of the works in this in this section, but also this uh, the mythical idea of the South um, and that narrative. So we're looking at the land in all different ways. So we've chosen one artist that we, it was hard to focus on one, but we've kind of boiled it down to one piece that we wanted to focus on. And the piece in the exhibition is this one right here, on, oops, excuse me, on the right, it's made, um, it's got twigs, hence, you know, the connection to the landscape. But I've also wanted to brought in this one on the left because this is actually in our permanent collection. The museum owns this piece and it's on view in our 21st century collection. So um, the artist that we see over here on the right, his name is Nick Cave. And Nick Cave is not only a visual artist, but he's also a trained dancer, performer, and, so his art sort of takes on this performance element as well, um, which I'm really drawn to. Um, I, you know, I kind of have a specialization in African art. And so there is a really strong connection. Um, with this piece, the one on the right, uh, like I said, it's called, a, it's a sound suit, just like the one on the, the left. They're part of a series that he does. They're, again, called sound suits. And these are, you know, costumes that can be worn and covered the entire body. This is reminiscent of the first sound suit that Nick Cave made. And it's really interesting how he kind of started this, this style of, of art. Um, in 1992, there was an incident in, in LA, which I'm sure a lot of people are, are familiar with, um, especially anyone who's, who's our age. Um, but Rodney King, he was beat by a group of police officers and it was one of the first incidents like this that was caught on camera for the world to see. And, um, you know, it was outrageous and horrific and um, yeah, just, absolutely traumatic for a lot of Black Americans and just a lot of Americans in general, I think, who saw that. Um, but, you know, when this happened, Nick Cave was, was very upset. And, you know, he started asking himself, how do I exist in a place that sees me as a threat? So one day he was outside, he was sort of thinking about this, he was looking on the ground and he saw a lot of discarded twigs and branches, kind of like in this picture, just laying all over the ground. And he really, he just felt the connection to those twigs and branches all of a sudden, this inanimate object that was discarded and kind of just left on the ground, just like, like garbage. And, and that's kind of how he felt. And he saw, he felt a connection with these branches and twigs and he started to collect them. He started to pick them up. And after a while he put them, started, you know, constructing them. And he really didn't even know what at first. And finally it got to be enough to where it, it was a, a, a suit and he put it on and, and it really became like a, a, a source of armor and protection. And that's kind of how these sound suits began as a form of protection for Nick Cave. But eventually, you know, he explored with different materials and um, different styles and these sound suits sort of transitioned. And now 
they're a form of expression of his personality and pride. It's no longer does he want to, you know, hide his race and his gender and hide, you know, it's more of an expression of who he is. And so these works have sort of transitioned in that way. And these were pieces that, you know, I know, uh, Robert, you were really drawn to as well. So. For sure. And for me, the, the, the beauty, thank you, first of all, Karen, for, for getting us set up and started in, in such a, a beautiful way. Um, it was some weeks ago when you and I were talking about this sound suit and you were talking more to me about the, the story of how Nick Cave finds sticks and twigs and puts them together. You told the story. I don't need to re retell it, but it, it reminded me of growing up myself. And it wasn't sticks and twigs that I was hiding behind, am hiding behind, but also using to to show my power as well, but it's music. And so that brings me to our conversation. I am not a scholar of African art or of black art, but or of art, but of music rather. And I, I grew up steeped in it in a lot of the traditions that we're sharing today. We're gonna listen to Let Freedom Ring, which is a new composition, copyrighted this year, in fact. The Aeolians, let me back up. Food, earth, and heirloom, three themes that Karen introduces us to. Heirloom here for sure. Uh, the Aeolians is personal to me in that their sound comes directly from the work that my family did as musicians and as church musicians, particularly from the university that the Aeolians come from. They're now the king of world choirs. They're fantastic. You're gonna hear why in a little bit. As we watch the video, um, we see the, the Aeolians, a group of black faces, every singer, every conductor, if there's an orchestra, typically the orchestra is composed of black people. The Aeolians sing this theme, uh, this drone that's rhythmic, that's harmonic, that's reminiscent of spirituals, although this is not one, it's a new composition. Uh, let freedom ring, they sing. Let freedom ring from the hills to the valleys. Let freedom ring. Here's the landscape there. We're drawing on the earth to sing for us and it's the song of freedom. As they sing this repetitive theme that is underlying, that never goes anywhere, suddenly we see faces that look a lot like the ones we're seeing now. They're different, they're diverse, they're varied. Still, the video is in black and white. We don't get to this color until later on, but you see these new faces come and they sing music that fits along very well with the underlying theme we've begun with, but is more European, a little bit more Anglo in sound. Every valley shall be exalted and every hill made low, these new singers present. As the Aeolians continue to preach and to pray and to scream, let freedom ring. They give us that theme again, and then these new faces come again. Um, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Let freedom ring, the Aeolians sing, and all flesh, all flesh shall sing it together. Let freedom ring. It's then, let, uh, let freedom ring that Suddenly we're seeing in what was once called technicolor, these diverse faces, the clothes that they wear bright and colorful and no longer are they segregated to the separate theme. The alien singing Let Freedom Ring and these other singers giving us other texts, but they are joining in song and in text the message that they're presenting. And it, it moves me nearly to tears every time I listen to it. When I think about landscape, when I think about the black art, I think it's impossible to not to think about the transatlantic slave trade bringing traditions, both mystical and magical, but also poignant and diverse and creative and heartfelt. They bring it with them across the body of water to new land. And it's that water and it's that land that houses our ancestors, something very uh, directly involved in African tradition, not only spiritual, but artistic. And then that music lands itself in the South of America. Um, it's mixed with ideas from Europe and travels through events like the Great Migration. The Aeolians are in Alabama. The uh, San Antonio uh, chamber singers are in California. But still that sound of enslaved African peoples moved around the country and created very new sounds like this, but still with that same old message. As we continue with the conversation, we're gonna get more into themes about how that past is reflected in our present and going forward as well as uh, in our future. Uh, but and before then, I wanna share an heirloom of, with you of my family in sonic impulse representation of this very theme. Okay. 
Just let me know when you want me to stop, Robert. Play the whole song. Freedom ring, let freedom ring, oh ring. From the hills to the valleys, let freedom ring. Let freedom, let freedom ring. Freedom ring. Let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. From the hills to the valleys, freedom ring. That was beautiful. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, man, I miss being in a choir. Somebody put me in a choir. Please. Oh, my God. That was beautiful. And it's a beautiful segue into the next section, um, which is religion and spirituality. Uh, you know, something that Robert was alluding to, you know, just a few moments ago was the, the transatlantic slave trade. And, you know, during that horrific voyage enslaved Africans brought with them um, a, a, a way of approaching, uh, you know, the, a, a religious system, you know, that was something that was ingrained in their being. Obviously, they weren't allowed to bring uh, material culture, but, you know, they brought with them a way of um, approaching life that uh so, you know, was applied to their conditions in the new world. And even though they weren't allowed to practice their indigenous religious beliefs, uh, they found ways to uh, uh, code, for example, like they, they found ways to blend with uh, Christian, a Christian religion, um, and still uh, recognize their own indigenous beliefs and, and gods. So, um, and it's really now developed into all sorts of, of really interesting um, religious practices that are are still um, you know in practice today, such as Santeria or Candoble or uh, Voodoo. Um, so all sorts of uh, impacts that that still has to this day. Um, but 
a lot of the artists in this exhibition, so in this section, you know, if it's not something that's directly related to religion, it, the idea of spirituality and, um, you know, the conviction with which uh, some of the artists choose to, to do their art, sometimes that's what is the focus. But uh, so however you want to spin it, it's, it's this idea of um, a deep belief system uh, in, in something. And Sonia Clark is, we've got this, and forgive the horrible image to the left, but a beautiful image of her in the middle, Sonia Clark uh, is, was li lived in the Richmond area for quite some time. She worked at VCU as a professor in the crafts and materials department, um, but she's a very successful artist. And we have some of her works in the collection, including this, this is a new acquisition. It's an installation piece. Um, and I'll switch to the next image because it's much better. This um, actually shows how it looks installed in the exhibition. So what we have is a piano um, with a lovely quilted bench. And then over on the wall, um, we see a miniature replica of the Liberty Bell. And she's got a crack in it and everything. But what she has... Uh, set this piano up to do or uh, programmed it, if you will, there's a, a light that sort of shines in and when it hits these notes, the piano will play, lift every voice and sing, which Robert, you know, being the, the music expert is going to talk about in just a few moments, but it's a really important, significant and symbolic song. Um, so the piano is set to play that when the light shines in hitting those notes. And also the bell over here, there is something she's done to it. The, instead of having a metal clapper on the inside that would ring the bell whenever it is you know, moved, she's replaced it with a ball or a tuft of her hair. Sonia Clark, that's something really interesting about her as an artist. She started to experiment with hair as a material. And she thinks of hair as a direct link or maybe indirect link to our ancestors. And what she has started to do is take uh, pieces of her hair and use them in instruments. Sometimes she'll string a violin bow and play uh, a string of her hair. Uh, as she puts it, to, to hear the voices of our ancestors when it plays. So if you think about our, your hair in that way and, and what she's done with it in this context, um, you know, a lot of people might bring something, a different perspective. I think um, a lot of the artists in this exhibition that are contemporary want that. They want visitors to come in. They don't want you, they don't want to tell you exactly what this means. I think they're, you know, they do have some intended meaning, but they're, for a lot of these artists, I think they really want visitors to bring their own experiences. So different people might interpret this Liberty Bell differently. Um, for me, when I, I see that tuft of hair that sort of muffles the sound of the bell, I think maybe this is a symbolic of, of um, the you know our African ancestors, their voices being muffled, perhaps not being heard. Maybe they were silenced, um, or maybe they're very low, and we need to listen very carefully. Um, so those are kind of some of the things that I take away. But I'm going to let Robert jump in and kind of share his perspective on this piece and tell us a little more about the significance of the song. 1920s, James Weldon Johnson, first poet's name I ever heard, writes, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Just stanza one, Uplift Every Voice and Sing, 1920s, I think 24 he writes it. It's not, however, till 1991 that this Lift Every Voice and Sing, commonly referred to as the Negro National Anthem, makes it into the National Archives. Melba Moore records it then. 
Uh, some time ago, I got to spend some time with her through the magic of Zoom. And we talked about that recording. We talked about the significance of the song. She didn't know it until then. Um, and she recorded it so that people like herself and those who it may not bear significance to could learn more about the Negro National Anthem as it exists. Izzy's just dropped in the chat the interview I had with Melba where we talked about this along with many other themes. Um, but lift every voice and sing, too long to share with you, but now you know how to look it up. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and it's still, yeah, it's just an iconic song. Um, very, very important. And James Weldon Johnson is a very important uh, writer, composer. Um, yeah, so, and as we go through, we've added in this piece really quickly. You'll, as you walk through the exhibition, it's in like a room of its own. This work is by an artist, Nadine Robin, Robinson, pictured here. It's called Coronation Theme, um, Organon 2008. And it is an amazing piece. It's huge. Um, and it plays uh, pieces of, of sermons, of protests, sounds, and yells, and voices, and, and other uh, mixtures of music meant to evoke sort of some emotion from viewers. Another thing that is very evocative with this piece, she's made it in the same shape as the facade of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, which is um, a very important historical church where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was the pastor. So, you know, this is a very important building uh, historically. And of course the music that, and the sounds that are played are significant to Atlanta's history as well. Um, anything before I move on with this, Robert, that? That was the, the main draw, the, the connection to the protest music. I think you can, if you research protest music on your own or listen to what we're saying here, I think you'll see a common theme of, of liberty and of freedom and of love. Um, being echoed. We saw Martin Luther King's image earlier, listening to Let Freedom Ring. And here is the building that, that birthed who he is <laughs> for all of us. Right. Um, and then we wanted to include this piece, these, these photographs by artist over here on the right, Marilyn Nance. Um, Marilyn Nance, she's known for her 20th century African-American, you know, images showing African-American life. Um, you know, she focuses on themes of spirituality, music, art, um, but, you know, she also is known for kind of putting a personal, very intimate spin on some of these pieces and really allowing the viewer um, to see just the humanity and in, in her, her sitters. Um, and we pulled these in, Robert saw these and I know he felt a real deep connection uh, personally, like kind of seeing it, looking in a mirror. Um, yeah, I mean, I see my face in the image of these young boys sleeping on these very uncomfortable wooden pews because they've been there all day long. Yeah. Chai choking them to death and they just had to get a nap. I just, I see myself there, it's hot. Yeah. It's not comfortable in that room and I'm done with what I got came there to do. Exactly. It's growing up in the church. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what I think she's trying to uh, to get at in these images, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and any, do you wanna? Soon I will be done. I think this is a good example of religion and of music finding its way into black culture and uh, mixing in the church. Here we have Julie McKnight, Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. This is a funeral service we're seeing her sing. We showed up and took over a funeral and she began singing, you'll hear her sing, Soon I will be done with the trouble of the world. No more weeping and wailing. I want to see my mother. I want to see my Jesus. Reminds, reminds me of the ancestral impact as well as the Christian impact to faith. Absolutely. Yeah. And just on that note, and, you know, the idea of a lot of traditional African cultural groups, uh, you know, have an a view of the life cycle as, as something cyclical, literally something mm -hmm. that's a transition rather than an end. And I think we see that in African-American traditions, the idea of celebratory uh, homecomings, if you will, rather than- For sure. Yeah, so, and sure. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and press play on this.
Wow. Oops. A few weeks ago, uh oh, here we go. Right. A few weeks ago, I did a dance program with Ia Ashan Ponmule, and we talked about African spiritual systems. And she raised a great point during that conversation that the spiritual systems of Africa are monotheistic, or as many people think they're polytheistic, but there is just one God in these systems. And these other spirits that we talk about are aspects of God for the human mind to better concept, have a concept of who God is. Too vast to be one being, so we give them 17 personalities to describe the same being. Um, and I think we see some of that in going home to live with God. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the, the important thing is just the diversity in, I mean, there's thousands of different, you know, indigenous uh, belief systems on the continent of Africa. And yeah, some of them are you know, monotheistic. There are, you know, some where like with the, the Yoruba, there's the Orisha, which they, you know, but mm -hmm. absolutely there are parallels and similarities and um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know we are course starting to run out of time. We have about six minutes to get through this last section before we, because we definitely want to give everybody time to ask questions and us to answer them. Um, but section three is focusing on the black body. Um, and, you know, the thinking about the black body and kind of, I think, you know, coming off of the section on spirituality and religion, and you see the, the physicality that sort of is uh, blended in with the, the, the worship and the, the sacred, um, you know, aspect. So there, there's the joyous movement of the black body that, you know, is kind of a focus in this section, but also there's the, the history of the, the South, the American South and the trauma that has, um, that the black body has sustained. So artists in this section are dealing with all of these things um, and then some. So uh, one of, you know, and this is interesting, I, maybe this is something we can discuss why this work is in this section that's something so let me first introduce this uh, work over on the left it, the title is if bells could talk and this is not in our collection however it's by this artist radcliffe bailey and the work that is in this image behind him called vessel i believe that is in our collection it's not on view at this time um but radcliffe bailey is an artist who you know, contemporary artist who loves working with objects that have some sort of historical resonance. He collects antiques, he collects old black and white uh, um, photography images, um, but just a lot of just antique material culture. So in this piece, this is way larger than life. It's on a huge, like, it's like a giant's music easel okay so i don't even know i don't have the measurements here but i i'm you know we're looking up it's huge um way above eye level so this is like an antique music stand on top of it is an antique 19th century bird cage that's opening up and spilling out of it are these trombones and trumpets and you know robert and i were talking about our different perspectives of this so you know, for me, when I see it, um, I, I see this bird page that's, it's like bursting open. And I, whenever I see a bird cage that's open, I think of freedom. And, um, you know, I know that Radcliffe Bailey is um, probably making some sort of nod to enslaved artisans and craftsmen who might have made materials like this, but also he's pointing to the history of jazz and brass band instruments. And I think by opening that bird cage, it has something to do with maybe the expressiveness, but also the freedom that comes with music and the, the freedom that maybe music has given um, some African Americans in some ways. But I don't know. Those are some of the things that I see. But then Robert shared his perspective. And it's really interesting how how you I thought that your perspective was a little different and very personal. Yeah. So this this piece I was telling you is what the most difficult one for me in the exhibition, although the, the whole exhibition can be tough. But for me, I see these bells 
in a cage on a pedestal and while it's open and they're performing and they're clearly loud, they're still in that cage. And they still are separate from me. They're way up high. I cannot approach them. I cannot reach them. And they're on a pedestal. And that reminded me of growing up the way I did. All Wherever I was, I was up high performing, singing and dancing for someone. Loud for a moment. But then I was still in that damn cage. Mm. And they closed the door on me. Felt like that my whole life. Still do now. And when I see it, I'm, I'm reminded of that. and trying to break through. And I wonder how many other performers or people with skin like mine or, or, or just don't look like what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to look like somebody else once told them once upon a time. How many times do they still feel like they're in that cage up on a pedestal? Like I do. Yeah, I'm sure it's a lot more than not. So that's that's really an interesting um, perception, so. But I love it. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great piece. Um, and just not just to keep moving, this is the last work we've included, then we'll stop for questions. But this is a video installation by Rashad Newsom. It's actually ours now. We acquired it in 2021 this year. So that's awesome. So if you've been through the exhibition, you know, when you get to this video installation, it's got music playing, it's kind of a, a looping video, but it's kind of this video montage that's been put together by Rashad Newsom. Um, you see him in, in this image here and down on the right bottom hand image um, in this really, you know, gosh, I, I don't even know how to, it's like a medieval inspired, like royal sort of outfit. Um, and essentially, you know, what he's doing is taking contemporary African American bodies and sort of thrusting them into this platform of European privilege and pomp and um, and he sort of reappropriated some of these emblems of royalty and uh, added a little flash to them like this very neo-baroque style and as I was when I first encountered it it just reminded me of an artist that some many of you probably know Kahende Wiley we have his rumors of war sculpture on the front lawn and his wonderful Willem van Heidhaus and painting, but he, that is what he does is takes uh, African black bodies, contemporary black bodies and puts them in this long standing European uh, mantle of privilege. So um, it's really about something that else about this video installation. It, it also is um, very much evocative of the ballroom gay dancing or voguing, what they called voguing. Madonna didn't, you know, create voguing. Um, it was from gay ballroom dancing of the 70s and 80s that is sort of um, hinted at in this video. And, you know, that's something that Newsom meant to do. He, he Newsom wanted to create a very inclusive space for the LGBTQ community, as well as people from different racial backgrounds, um, just really creating an accessible space. And um, Robert? For sure. And just briefly, we got to get to your questions, but um, Izzy has to drop on the chat. Uh, our last jazz cafe installation was with Drew Miles, and he's written an educational piece he calls the opera. Uh, that he's using to take the themes that we see in opera. And what I think about is Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk, but I don't know if that's what's in his brain, but that's what it appears to me. One artist taking all of the elements of the show and creating them himself from the sound to the words, to the lessons that are being taught. And he uses hip hop and jazz beginning with an aria from an opera. Uh, he uses hip hop and jazz to tell old stories. His goal is to educate folks younger than likely all of us on this call mm -hmm. about things that, that they may not be interested in by adding rhythm to today's culture, but using names like um, Louis Armstrong or, or people from the past that he can teach these wonderful things to. And Izzy's got that link there that she can drop into the chat. The opera, Drew Miles. Okay, that's great. And as you can see, we could probably go on talking about this for most of the day, but we want to pause it here and take your questions. Should I stop sharing, Izzy? Or no, it... no, please no? keep your okay. up just in case yes. you can navigate back. Absolutely. Um, so one question did come up, and if anyone has any others, please do um, drop that in the chat or the Q&A. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, and by we, I mean Karen and Robert. <laughs> Um, so Karen, one question that came up was about, um, the last work that you were just discussing, um, 
could you just provide a, a you said it's a video work. Um, what's happening in that video work? Um, you know, th this costume um, that we're seeing in the still, um, I'm, is there anything you can kind of share with us? So it is like, it's, so it's set to music and it's Rashad Newsom scene here, but also just a whole entourage of people that I don't really know, um, but they're all decked out in just like a similar regalia as him, very royal regalia, just a lot of gold and, and um, uh, you know, royal emblems and things that have, you kind of see a marching band behind them yeah. in this clip. So they kind of, in part of it, they sort of walk down this promenade and, and it's kind of, you know, they, they're steps up to the throne. It's kind of just this, a coronation um, almost. That's kind of like what they're, what they're looking to represent, but yeah, I, and, and, it, and it looks like that. I think if you remove the music that is played on this video and put something like Zadok the Priest over it, it would just be a coronation. It wouldn't look like, like a marching band. I think if you put some something on there, it'd be different. Yeah. Wedding March of Mendelssohn or something. And Robert, I'm reminded of um, when we were uh, honored to host Kehinde Wiley for the Rumors of War installation and mm -hmm. all the work you did on um, a, a request that he had. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what Kehinde wanted for that event and all the work you did for it, because it really does relate to what you're describing here. You know, it does. And coincidentally, uh, Drew Miles, who I was just talking about, was a part of that night. Kehinde really wanted a party. He wanted a spectacle, which included a marching band. So we, with the help of people like Drew Miles, collected uh, the by all city marching band. Um, Christy Joe Adams helped us with that. Uh, and we put together a marching band of five students. They marched and played and danced in the rain mm -hmm. through the entire sculpture garden, ending up to, at the unveiling of the Kehinde. I, I was moved in interviewing Drew last week to learn that the kids did not understand the impact of what they were doing when I showed up at their rehearsal. Mm -hmm. But by the time they were on our campus, they had their uniforms on and their instruments in their hand. Uh, the shrouded sculpture was within view. They began to see it, a few of them, and began to whisper to the other kids in the crowd about the impact they were about to have, about the things that they were feeling. And 100% of those kids suddenly, because it came from a peer and not from a stranger like myself, understood the, the impact of what they were doing, the importance of what they were doing. And they played and they played. You'll remember the tarp got stuck and those kids just kept playing. They, were, they weren't gonna let silence uh, deafen our evening at all. I mean, it, it, it was quite a lot, a lot of rehearsals I don't remember how many kids, like a hundred kids marching through the, the sculpture yeah. garden to perform for 5,000 or so that came from around the city to be a part with us. It was gorgeous. Yeah, and so just another connection, you know, Karen had already made to Kende Wiley um, to, to a work in our collection of visual, um, but here we see a similarity in the importance of bands. And um, yeah, so I was just reminded of that. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. And I did just drop in a very short video that our videography team had made of that event. So you can see it or relive it if you were there in person. Uh, another question that came in, more of an opinion. Um, did any work of art surprise you in this exhibition? And if yes, why? Um, well, it's not too exciting of an answer, but and I don't, it's not in here, although it's similar to this. There's the, the David Hammonds that's called Strange, Strange Fruit. I was shocked at how big it is. Like I, you know, as I was preparing for this exhibition, like for a long time, I hadn't seen any of the objects in person. And so I just been looking at the image and I really didn't realize how big it was. So when I saw it in person, it was huge. So that was one of the biggest surprises, but again, that wasn't a very exciting answer. Um, well, mine is this one, if Bells could talk. I mean, it, you can kind of see the ceiling above it to see yeah. just how tall it is. It, it's huge, it's grandiose, it's, it's monstrous. I didn't expect to, to feel the way I felt when I saw any of the exhibition. I felt expected to be heavy and other portions are certainly gonna be heavier for somebody else, but this thing makes me wanna cry. Yeah. Like I'm trying not to cry for y'all right now, but this this yeah. thing right here surprises me when I see it. it it's huge and it, it says so much. 
Yeah. And I'm not a presenter, but um, and and Karen, you may have to help me with the uh, with the exact work. But the the chapel, um, I think it's one of the ones that's been most heavily Instagrammed. But um, I love in the chapel. Digital, um, um, the red chapel, the interior. Oh, the do um, asterisk in Dockery by Rodney McMillan. Thank you. Right, yeah. Um, I feel like it's so great that visitors are able to go in and engage with the work. It's not something that you only have to look at. You can go sit. I took my son and he just went all around the space. And um, that was something that really surprised me. You know, the digital image can't capture everything, but this exhibition really feels like something that you should visit in person if possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and like I said, there's, you know, like 130 different objects i mean there's and they're all different artists basically and uh just a variety of works and uh it's just it you have to probably come back more than once honestly yeah to really enjoy it so sometimes i give tours to my artists and i have no idea how i'm gonna i, <laughs> I would give a tour of this one but i i'm up for the challenge yes well, um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop them in now. If not, we'll start to wrap up. Uh, and so Karen and Robert, with that, I think we will wrap yeah. up. Thank you so much, both mm -hmm. for your time and knowledge and personal um, response. This was just fantastic. Thank you all so much for attending this month's 3 and 30 plus The Dirty South. And thank you, Karen and Robert. Absolutely. This was great. Thanks, I still know things. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.